the cool thing about the book of Acts, they wrote it, the book of Acts is the book of the apostles, what they did. It should be called the book of Jesus, right? Because Luke, the doctor, wrote it. Everybody knows that, right? And it didn't stop from Luke to the book of Acts. It did stop because of the scrolls. That's why there's two books. That's the way I understand it. But it really doesn't matter. You know, I guess a scroll would have been like tons of feet long as they were writing the book. Before we get into um, the book of Acts, we're going to go over to Luke 24, 44. And I love this because um, the book of Acts, they're totally relying on Jesus totally relying on the Spirit of God to move them to do what they needed to do. And we're going to notice tonight that Jesus sends them back to this, the exact place that He got killed at in Jerusalem. Now you could look at that and go, really Lord? They just killed you over there. And you rose again. Wouldn't you kind of think as if you were a disciple like, Man, that's pretty crazy, ain't it? So, Let me go to, where did I say, 44. The Scripture opens, Then He said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the, in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning Me. And He opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures then he said to them thus it is written and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and the third day and rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until, I can't say that word, until you are endured with power from on high. And I like that, that Jesus promised him that, right? We'll see that Luke recorded it that He promised it to them. And this ain't about knowledge in the book of Acts. You know, and what we need, we don't need knowledge. You know, lots of people think, you know, we're in here getting knowledge and learning about God and learning about people in the Bible, but the way God operates. But the main thing is we need to be engulfed in the Holy Spirit when we're witnessing to people outside. I know tons of people in this room, we have witnessed to people and it wasn't Holy Spirit led. Anybody ever done that? I don't need a show of hands. But, you know, I've done it a couple times and it didn't really work out too well. And other times you could feel when the Spirit's moving. Amen. Right? You could feel when God's moving when you're when God ordains it and He fills you, He indwells you with the Holy Spirit. We're going to learn about being filled with the Spirit tonight and being like baptized in the Holy Spirit when we're out there doing what we need to do for Jesus. Ain't nothing changed from these times right now. And we and then we're gonna look at the end of this book, I mean the end of this chapter, that he tells his disciples that it's not for you to know the times or the dates or the seasons when I'm coming back. We're gonna learn that tonight that if we knew that we'd probably be lazy. Amen? I don't know, but it could be. Okay, so chapter 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus begun both to do and teach. I love that right there. And who is Theophilus? I don't really know. Not a whole bunch of people really know who Theophilus is. Right? But if you look at the name Theophilus, it is God lover. Did you know that? The name Theophilus, however you say it, is God lover, or lover of God. So, and I like that too, that 
He's given an account of what Jesus did and what He taught. <clears throat> Until that day in which He was taken up after He, through the Holy Spirit, had given, given commandments to the apostles whom He had chosen, <clears throat> to whom He also presented Himself alive after His suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. I like that that God gives them the commandments and if we look at what He gave them, you'll see inside um, um, I can't, I think it's it's one of the Gospels. Right? That um, He gave them a new covenant. And commandments. And we're going to chew all this up when I get through it. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the proper promise, promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard me, for John truly baptized with water but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. I like that he doesn't give them a certain time. He says you'll be... And you got to understand that they were already believing in Jesus and he already gave them the Spirit, I believe. But I believe that he was given... He, we need to be engulfed in the Holy Spirit when we're out preaching the Gospel. We can't do it on our own accord. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not your for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all of Judah and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And I love this right here because if you look at Acts, the way Acts is laid out, like if you look at the way it's all laid out, 1 through 7, they're going to be in Jerusalem preaching the gospel. If you look 8 from 12, they're going to be in Judah and Samaria. And then at the 13 through 28, they're going to be going to the ends of the earth. That's how Acts is laid out, how they give the, the gospel. And... Um, Man, could you imagine that, like I was saying earlier, if God told them, hey, I'm coming back at this time, or I'm going to restore the kingdom at this time. You know, and he said, I'll be back in 2,000 plus years. What do you think they would have been thinking? Think it would have been discouraging? Would you think that? It would have been a little discouraging, I think. I don't know. But, um, and... That's cool because they had to wait for the Holy Spirit to receive power. What do we need more of? Not more knowledge. We need more of Jesus' power when we're out on the street. And it's all good to be teaching and knowing and seeking the Word of God. But the, the main thing is, is that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit when we're out there showing people love. Especially in these times. You, anytime, right? Like I was just driving from my house tonight, leaving after dinner, and I seen the next door neighbors, I was telling Mike and Deb, the next door neighbors just moved in. <coughs> right? Just moved in. I haven't really seen them. I see it go in and out. Then I seen another house was sold. I seen there's two cars in the um, driveway. And God let me know. You ever bring get a pie from your neighbor? Anybody ever get a pie or something when you first move into a neighborhood? Yeah. We have. The neighbors came up, gave us a pie. Wow. Yeah. We were so friendly. And, <laughs> and they were so friendly. And they were like, oh, come over for a swimming party and this and that. And kids were jumping all over the pool and they brought a pie over. Wow. Nice. So I'm going to bring Bibles to the two neighbors that just moved into the house. Oh, that's awesome, honey. No matter what they say. I'm going to walk up the door, knock on the door, and go, hey, welcome to the neighborhood. Here's a his and hers Bible. for One for your husband, one for your wife. They take it, they take it, right? 
And that's being Holy Spirit like, because I would have never thought of that. So don't give me no credit. But that we need to be witnessing all the time, but we have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I might give them a pie too, you know what I mean? But they're getting the Bibles no matter if they want them or not. I'm just kidding. Can you buy the pies? I'm kidding. No, we'll have Kendra cook them. But right, you know, God's going to show us all the time how to deal with different people as long as we're submitting to His power. Not our own power. Right? He always shows us when we're out on our bikes, man. Isn't the, I mean, it's crazy who comes up to us. And there were some whack jobs that come up to us. <laughs> what do you think these disciples got in, in Jerusalem? And they were preaching Jesus that just died. We're doing the same thing. Preaching Jesus that died and rose again. So tonight, if you want to be baptized, I mean, you want the Holy Spirit, we'll pray for you. Number nine. Now when he had spoken these things while they were while they watched, he was taken taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfast toward heaven as he went up, behold two men stood that stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven, this same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will also, I mean, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So we see two angels. Tell them, what are you doing standing up? You're walking with Jesus for all this time, three years, and they see him go up. And they're like, you see, I mean, just start to levitate, right? Then he goes up and a cloud receives him. Well, the cool thing is that is he went up at the Mount of Olives. Did you guys know that? And you know where he's going to come back? Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives. Isn't that cool? So as I was reading this, I was thinking, man, that's like my, my drone I have. Right? It goes up and then I, wherever it took off from, it'll land exactly where I tell it. You know, home. It was just crazy. I thought of that, but like, it's cool. Jesus is gonna come back the exact way he left. And don't. What I was thinking too, as he was, as these two angels were talking to him, what are you guys doing here? You got work to do. You gotta go to Jerusalem and wait. Right. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olive which is near Jerusalem about a Sabbath day journey and they and when they had entered they went up into the upper room where they were staying Peter James John Andrew Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew James the son of the Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas, the son of James, these all counted, Continue. continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. <clears throat> we'll chew that up too, but I like that that they were up there praying. You know what I mean? And in these days, 15, and in these days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. What's that word? All together. The number of names was about 120. And he said, Men and brother, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, <clears throat> for he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity and fell headlong. He burst open in the middle and all his internal gushed out. 
and it became known to all those who dwelled in Jerusalem so that the field is called in their own language Lyle that is field that is field of blood for it is written in the book of Psalms let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it and another take his office therefore these men who have accompanied all of us all. Accompany us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us begun from the baptism of John to the day when he was taken up from us of, from us one of those must become witnesses a witness. a witness with us of his resurrection <coughs> Thir- 23 and they opposed, opposed to proposed. proposed to called Joseph Barabbas who was surnamed, surnamed Judas and Justice. Justice and Mathis and they prayed and said to you. said you O Lord who know the hearts of all show which of these two have chosen you have chosen chosen to take part in his ministry and apostles from which judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place and they cast their lots and the lot fell on mathis and he was numbered with the eleven apostles now, as I was reading this, I mean, Peter took it upon himself. I don't see anywhere I tried to research where God said, Jesus said to him, hey, fulfill that office. And as I was looking at this, I was thinking, man, I think, you know, they did it in the flesh at first. Because the simple fact is, is God had his eye on someone else. And that was Saul from Tarsus. That's what I believe. And we can now that I've read that so I'm just saying we've all made that mistake called someone to something thought they could handle it or thought we were doing the right thing and we didn't bathe it in prayer obviously they cast lots and um, so I think that um, we don't really hear about that guy that got picked too much if any we hear a lot about Paul right so with that I'll open it up and we'll start chewing. Anybody, any takers? Don't all raise your hands at once. Yes, Mike, you're on line one. Thank you for calling in. I was, I found it was very interesting to skip with great details about that. And uh, it had, he had a really good opening. I'm gonna finish watching some more ads with him. I like that, I decided to read that. He, he details some things on Luke how he started out, you know, and how he progressed through Acts as instead of speaking in a third person like he did in the <coughs> beginning to where he started partaking in the actions of the apostles he was working with or recording, which was very interesting. That's all I got. Thank you. Uh, so isn't there... Um like a criteria to be classified as an apostle, right? Don't you have to um, have seen um, the Holy Spirit, right? The risen Jesus. Right. So um, if Matthias had been one who had seen them, then, well, it makes perfect sense to make him an apostle, but... Right? I mean, why why wouldn't they, if if he had, if he had been one that had seen, I mean, right? So why would, what, what's the problem with him being made an apostle? There wasn't a problem. The problem was, is I think that Paul was chosen and not him. That's my personal opinion, but I'm not... 
as, as I read the whole book, you know what I mean? I just, in, in that whole thing, I just noticed, again, how, how Peter, Peter takes the lead as a leader, and interestingly, <coughs> enough, he's in front of the 120 people, which is, in Jewish law, a, a, like a colony, I believe, is that right? Russ? Yes. Yeah, like a colony, which is uh, enough to make a decision. I just to thought start that a temple. start a temple, and so make a decision. And I just, I just loved, I, I like Peter, Peter's personality and his zeal to do the right thing, and it, it was based off of Psalms, and who knows? And you know, right now, at this present moment, they hadn't been, they hadn't been baptized with the Holy Spirit. We make mistakes. It doesn't really matter. I don't think. I mean. But one thing that I did, I, you do notice, and that is controversial, and for me, and I think in this, for other people maybe, is, you know, there are, there, there are the twelve apostles that were chosen, and and some people in some churches believe that there, there are still apostles today, and and I think, and you know, just a recent church that we went to, they call people apostles, and I. I I always have a, I personally, I, I don't know why, I, I have a problem with it. I just think that those people, those people were the apostles. It's completely different than somebody like us who are sent. We're, we're Christians that, you know, carry the message. I don't know, I just, I don't like titles. But I do know that this came up in a recent church that we were at, and they were calling people apostles, apostle this, apostle that. And I, I, I actually questioned the pastor and his wife, because I, I, and I really don't like, I really never settled, the answer never settled with me, but that's my, I noticed that that happens, that, that that's one thing that's controversial in, the, in certain churches. Well, before Russ talk, I don't want to just get hooked on how much or what, they made a mistake, they didn't make a mistake, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit yeah. and being engulfed in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit work that was going on in the book of Acts. That's what we need to focus on. That's what the book of Acts is about, about the Spirit moving in these people and working that Jesus is still alive. For us, you're on line one. The former account I made to the Theolopolis of all of Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after... He, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive. For he suffered by many infallible proofs, being seen, and I have this underlined, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with him, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. Two things that I think are very much key in the book from start to finish is it's starting where it ended. And it's starting with 12 where it ended with 12 tribes. I think those two are parallel and I think that they're important, especially for the foundation of the first church. So it's starting again. That's not a coincidence. God's return is where? It started right there where it ends and where it's going to end again. That's where the second coming will be. So I think that's an important factor. Something else that in verse 8 it says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. I underline this. And you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem. He says, to me in Jerusalem. And then he says, and in all of Judea and uh, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I've heard even my pastor has talked on the topic um, and my previous pastor about the fact that when this was first being laid out that Luke was probably in Jerusalem by himself and the rest of them were in Judea and Samaria and then came back and gathered at the Mount of Olives and then went into the upper room. And then the gospel was spread throughout the ends of the earth from there. So for whatever reason, I believe, my interpretation of my footnotes is, is God was working on Luke standing fast in Jerusalem at that moment. When uh, 
when the angels tell them, you know, hey, what are you looking at? And they're standing up there and gazing. You know, I'm tripping on that because you got to imagine what they, not only were they tripping on the fact that he's taken off, but they're sitting there like, hey, man, what's next? You know, they're waiting, they were still waiting for, um, uh, the restoration of the military and the political kingdom that was going to come in and drive out the Roman, the Romans. You know, so there was a lot of stuff to, to look at there. So they're sitting here, and Jesus is taking off, and they're like, hey man, where are you going? <laughs> There's still all kinds of stuff to do, you know? And, uh, and, and the whole point of it was exactly like what Kenny said. Wait until, wait until I send you a helper, the Holy Spirit. But I just tripped on that, man. You just imagine if we were in their shoes, just stand there, just like, what? What? where are you going, man? What's going on? But sitting on, on that mountain in the garden and looking across the valley, Kidron Valley, and looking at the, the unmarked, poor grave sites that are still that field that nobody owns, nobody's possessed, nobody has built on, right outside the holy city and looking across that valley and realizing to this day that prophecy is still fulfilled oh, yeah. nothing is there and then to to think about the fact that they call it in this chapter a half a sabbath journey which is about two hours so those roman soldiers coming for jesus that night on the mountain he watched them at night with torches come across that valley which is now a cemetery for people who have no money and was from that day on. Crossing that valley that is still untouched where they marched to come and take the Messiah. I mean, it's one of the most powerful visuals I got when I was in Israel and any of the trips. That spot was the one that I just weeped. Just looking at Jerusalem, the city sitting there, and that barren valley and then the mountain, and realizing God getting upset with his, or Jesus getting upset with his disciples, can you not see the Son of Man is about to betray, be betrayed when he could boogie over the other side of the mountain and be gone? And he couldn't even stay awake. I mean, the picture's just, it's awesome. And that's where he's coming back. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. How many people are going to be sitting on that mountain waiting when he comes back? because that mountain will be splitting in two. <laughs> right? so you right? want to be on the right side. Of it. Yeah, you want to be on the right side. But isn't that isn't that just a isn't that just a hair pitch above it the is Temple above Mount? The city. Yes. Yeah, you look down on on Jerusalem from that mountain. Mike, I think one of the things that hit me was, you know, Jesus is he's been with these guys for for three years now. His departing words is knowing exactly what lies ahead for these guys, for the church. The persecution that's going to begin in just four or five chapters down the road. Mm. The one thing that he spoke on and wanted them to get was the need for the Holy Spirit. They had to have that to endure what they're fixing to go through. You know, 60 years from now, from this, from that time, approximately, John wrote the book of Revelation, and in chapters two and three, it's about the church. What had happened in that 60-year period? You know, when Jesus is talking about the church and, and, and the, the avenues that it had, it had taken, it had become so so corrupt. I heard a, a pastor one time talk about. He quoted. Uh, A.W. Tozer, and I just hold it up. I want to read it real quick, short. <clears throat> it says, uh, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop, and everybody would know the difference. Mm. It speaks it speaks volumes. I mean, there's yeah. so much today going on in the church that is, Jesus is not even invited. His word certainly isn't. You know, 
don't know, that's jumped out at me, the importance of that, of operating in, in the spirit of the necessity for it. You have to read the Word of God and study it. Amen. And you have to dig in. Because the simple fact is, wouldn't you want to know your Jesus? Wouldn't you want to know? But the thing is, we want to be empowered with the Holy Spirit. And if we're empowered with the Holy Spirit, He's going to have you praying more. He's going to have you reading more. And you're going to want to read. Because it's going to become a joy. Because like the persecution they went through, you know, there's no way you could go through the persecution mm -hmm. and any of this without His Spirit. That's right. And they're, like Mike was saying, there's no way that they could have went through this, right? If you just look at the history of the church, what happened to them in Rome, man, they were like, they were hiding in places. They were going to other, other parts of the world. They were getting impaled. All kinds of stuff was happening to them. And there was a lot of them that said, pick me. And that's because they were Holy Spirit led. They, had, they didn't have fear. Some of them did when Paul, we're going to read about him, when he came around, because he was stone cold killer. Oh yeah. He was a stone cold killer. He was going to kill Christians. And there is people in this world right now that hate us. They want nothing to do with us. And if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to be in fear. It's, it's this. I love the book of Acts. I, mean, I love the whole Bible, but I love the book of Acts. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Curtis. Talking about being in somebody's shoes. That For some reason, God has given me this. When I read the Bible, I try to put myself in each character's shoes what they were going through at each time. Try to, you, know, you never know what's going, what, what a man's doing unless you walk a mile in his, his, his shoes. And you think about these gentlemen, think about the apostles. They were with Jesus for three years, seen all the miracles, went through everything with Jesus, you know. And then they watched Jesus just ascend into heaven, rise from the grave, ascend to the heaven, you know, and they physically touched him knew that he was he was really alive mm -hmm. and then they see him ascend to heaven then they he tells them before he goes he goes wait gather back i will send send you somebody that will help you and you know it was like blind trust being willing i mean to do what i've done in my christian life uh, i was just willing i wasn't equipped I'm sure you wasn't equipped either when you took over doing what you were doing. You were just willing. You just wanted to do something. And God used that. And that's the same with these guys. You know, they were just willing. You know, when Jesus came around, they thought he was going to be their savior from the Romans. But that wasn't true. What he was going to be used as their savior from the world. <coughs> from, from, from Satan. But, but they were willing. So they met, met in that room as we read further. And then the Holy Spirit descended on me. Can you imagine how their minds were blown? Mm. You know, and all of a sudden they looked around and looked over at each other and they had little flames sitting above their head and they started speaking in different <laughs> languages. You know, and they had, what in the heck is that? I want some, you know? It's, it's crazy, but that's where I put myself. And, and to realize and understand those guys' thoughts and, and how they... You know their hearts were broken because Jesus was gone. That was their, that was their man. You know, but then they realized after they received the Holy Spirit that Jesus is always with them. Just empower, it really empowers you. Mm -hmm. I know it's it's great. I love that that Peter was bold, oh, yeah. and that's the way we need to be bold for Jesus. If we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, nothing stops me, and I got a big mouth. A couple weeks ago, we were studying Matthew 26, and Peter had denied Jesus. Now, I don't know how much time had transpired here, 40 days plus a, a few here and there. But you take Peter the night that Jesus was arrested and him denying Christ. Fast forward, let's, let's call it two months. Peter being empowered with the Spirit, what a difference 
what a huge difference, like Jen said, he's sort of the leader, you know, the self-appointed leader. Well, we need to, we need to pick another apostle, you know, right or wrong, whatever. He felt he was, you know, operating in the spirit, and maybe he was, you know, I don't know, but what a difference being empowered by the spirit will make. What a difference. In a short period of time with Peter. You were saying he was standing there and, and then he got taken up. But thank God for for the way he speaks to us and through the angels that they confirmed what they'd already heard from the from other accounts when they were walking with Jesus, because he did say in all the gospels, I believe, and here's an example just in Matthew three eleven, I indeed <clears throat> baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So they'd already heard it before, and so it was just a confirmation. And then his, all the promises, all the things that Jesus had already said up until now, including seeing all the miracles, had happened. And so they, they could bet their bottom dollar <laughs> that this was going to happen too, just as all the things that we've seen happen in the Bible has already ha happened. We can be assured that the last bit of what we've been studying in Daniel and Revelations will happen too. It's just, it's just amazing. The promises are, are to a T and perfect and coming to a theater near you. <clears throat> the importance of this you, you said something. Um, you said something in the beginning um, about it. it's just basically a continuation nowadays of what's going on. You know, let me read this real quick. This is the this is a little theme, that, a little footnote that I have. It says, "In Acts, believers are empowered by the Holy Spirit to bear witness to the good news of Jesus Christ amongst both Jews and Gentiles, and in doing this, they establish the church." In addition to this, Acts explains how Christianity, although it is new, is in reality the one true religion rooted in God's promises from the beginning of time. In the ancient world, it was important that a religion be shown to have stood the test of time. Thus, Luke presents the church as a fulfillment and extension of God's promises. So, it's it's a trip because, and, and I, I watched the same thing all you guys did too and skip touched uh, skip it said one thing it's amazing because this is where it started this is right here where it started and and the totality of it if you look at where we're at here we are literally on the complete other end of the spectrum from where this started so it's reached out there and where we are nowadays is basically a continuation you know what I'm saying we continue on and where all that, where the areas have reached, and they're reading this, they continue on in those areas and just keep expanding, 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 and keep doing what these guys were set up to do in the first place. You want to go to one second, Bert? You want to go to um, John twenty? John. John twenty nineteen through twenty two. Go ahead, Bernie. The book of Acts itself is basically how, how the gospel and the word of God was spread from Jerusalem through Rome. And that's pretty much what they show us here. And, and how we've said already through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit leads you, if you're willing, to share the gospel and he leads you in prayer and he leads you on how to share and what to say to people. I mean. There's been times when I've prayed for people, that, and I'm sure for any of us here, that I couldn't tell you a single thing I said when I would pray him because it was all Holy Spirit led, you know. But it was being willing to do it and then allowing the Holy Spirit to work through you. And it's the same thing then as it is now. When we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit living in us, correct? He. The disciples already got the Holy Spirit when he rose from the dead in the upper room when they locked the door. And I'm going to let Lyle read it. It's from John 20, 19 through 22. On the evening of the day, the first day of the week, 
the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, mm -hmm. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, even so I am sending you. He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so that's why I believe that it's that Jesus is talking the same Spirit that I'm talking about when we're on the move. Beat the baby. Just kidding. Cut. It's my granddaughter. Don't do it. <laughs> so, um, did someone else have their hand up here first? Where were, we, where were you reading from? Dennis, that was John 20. 20, 19 through 22 to 23. You know, I looked up the 12 disciples and it says here, Unity believes that the 12 apostles are the team that Jesus brought together to tell the world about our inherent divine nature called the Christ within. The 12 apostles represent the 12 fundamental aspects or faculties that embody our divine nature. I had never heard that before. I heard something when I was at Lincoln Christian about the instructor believed that the 12 represented the 12 nations. So, I don't understand what the 12 fundamental aspects are. An example you were talking about when the Spirit fell, like like on, on King David, the Spirit had fallen on him. On, on Samson, the Spirit had fallen on him. For a particular task, mm -hmm. being born again, and that and that spirit. I think I agree with you. If it, if I understand what you're saying, it's sort of two different things. Yeah. Or we're out on our motorcycles, or we're out anywhere mm -hmm. in a grocery store, or anything, or just out. It's been it's happened to us hundreds of times. Amen. And we've been out, and God has, or we've prayed before we went out. We prayed before we went out on our bikes or prayed before we left the house or whatever and asked the Lord to use us. And the Lord disordains the whole entire thing when we're speaking to someone because you could tell it hit them like a ton of bricks. You know, and lots of times they receive the word. Like just the other night I got a text from a guy <clears throat> that thanked me. I ain't talked to him for years. I didn't even know he had my phone number anymore. And he thanked me for coming up and talking to him after church and he accepted the Lord, I mean, he listened to my testimony. Then he went up, accepted the Lord, and he's been a Christian for like 10 years now. And he texted me and thanked me. And I was like, man, where did that come from? Who's that? You know, I'll tell you after. So, um, his name's Gino. But, um, yeah. you know, that's what I'm talking about. We, we receive the Holy Spirit when we first become a Christian. And then when we're out, the Lord ordains it, you know, and the Spirit falls upon us. Richard, you had your hand up, brother? Um, well, part of that is, is what I was thinking when Peter was in jail, and the disciples were all together, and they started praying. And instead of praying that God would take away all this persecution, they prayed that God would give them boldness to preach the gospel. Because when the disciples in upper room got baptized in the Holy Spirit, they were they received boldness. That's how Peter could stand up and tell all these people about Jesus. And that's the whole thing about being baptized in the Spirit. You get boldness. You get power to do what God has called you to do. And you don't care about anything. You just know that He's called you to do this and you have the boldness to do it. So you go for it. And that's what's awesome about the Holy Spirit. I don't know how He does it, you know. It makes, makes us bold when we were not bold before. You know, it's crazy. But it's a, it's a promise. It's a gift that He gave us. And we, we just run with it. I was bold before, but for stupid reasons. And God turned it all around. Now we have to be humble and bold. You know what I'm saying? The more we um, submit to Him, the way better it is, believe me. We've been in a couple situations with some guys, or a guy one time, well, it's been a lot, but like, you know, 
one time I remember we were out at Cafe Rio and this guy he could have handed us a couple good ones but you know we the cool thing is is the Holy Spirit showed up amen, amen. and that's how it works you know go into it with the flesh come out of it with bruises go into it with the spirit come out of it with joy that's how it works yes sir um, with what you asked about the 12 disciples they were all different but they were all the same um, you had fishermen you had a tax collector uh, you had a tent maker they all had different professions come from different backgrounds and um, as you pointed out you know it comes from a boldness when the spirit comes upon you well a boldness from a tax collector might be different in his speech and his portraying the gospel than a fisherman or a kinney. You know what I mean? We're all different pieces of the puzzle. We all react and we're all we're all made differently and uniquely in Christ, but with that empowerment from the Holy Spirit, our, our testimony and our mission field is different from each one of those regards. So I don't know that that answers your question, but the twelve were different. They were all sluggos like we are, but they were all individually different in what they did for a living and, and how they operated. I mean, Luke was a physician, so I'm sure he wasn't the same as Peter who draws a sword. He's the guy that stitches you up. So it's all the different characteristics of those things. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. And one thing I'll say, you know, that just came up while you were saying that, as to add to that, is the cool thing is there's some people in here that are not bold and there's some people in here that are going to have doubt when you're out talking and bringing the gospel to someone that you don't know you you know what I mean and you're going to have a little bit of doubt some people and be like a Thomas just ask God to show you and God will show you and you'll be able to put your hand in his side not physically but you know what I'm saying he will come and show you and he will guide you and lead you it's amazing when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, especially when you're engulfed in it. It just blows my mind like Richard and Bern, all of us were saying, because sometimes you don't, you think it's going to go one way, and it goes totally the opposite, and it's just, you're like, like he said, that's crazy. Go ahead, brother. But see, that's what, that's the, that's the cool thing that makes this thing work. When we come together, God we each have our own individual personalities and zeal and whatnot. You know what I'm saying? So there's people that you could talk to that I can't. There's people I could talk to that you can't. You know what I'm saying? And it works like that. And that's just God God uses that. And we come together in a group like that and we go out and, and, and for God and minister, you know what I'm saying? He, it's, it's amazing, man. You think we covered chapter one? Because we could do it again next week. Or do you want to see, see tongues of fire over their heads?